Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. For me, visiting a plant place is like visiting an ice cream store. I am addicted to and love both. Today we are in for a real treat as Prairie Yard and Garden is going on an adventure to visit a place that I've heard so many good things about with lots of beautiful plants and some unusual ones too. It is always fun to see how people use plants in their yards. It is also fun to visit with people who are very knowledgeable about the plants they grow. Today we have the best of both worlds as we are visiting with Steve Kelly and Arla Carmichael near Long Lake, Minnesota. Welcome Steve and Arla. We're delighted to have you here. Well, thank you for letting us come. Now, please tell me a little about your plant backgrounds, Arla first and then Steve. Well, um, I'd grown up with plants. My mom and my grandmother had always had gardens and plants. And I decided that I wanted to be a gardener in a profession. And I went to school, um, was fortunate enough to get an internship at Norenberg Gardens with Three Rivers Park District. Um, gosh, that would be probably 31 years ago now, and have sort of worked my way up um, and now am in charge of horticulture for the Park District. And how about you, Steve? Well, unlike Arla, I didn't want to be a gardener all my life. I, uh, I grew up in a family business, Kelly & Kelly, which has been in business for four generations now, and I was so close to it I thought, this isn't for me. So I went to school and got a degree in journalism at the University of Minnesota and had trouble finding a job that, I, that suited me. So come spring, Dad said, uh, why don't you come to work for the company this summer? You can go back to looking for a job in the fall. So one of Dad's uncles took me under his wing at the nursery and took me around to some of his jobs and introduced me to his customers. And I thought, well, maybe there is something here. So I've been at it uh, full time since 1970. Just love it. Oh. I wouldn't go back to writing for a minute. When you do planting, do you use annuals or perennials in your beds or some of both? Um, in the beds, I think that we usually try to stick with perennials. Um, there are some annuals that we can't do without, so we stick them here and there in the garden. But just for, I think, uh, maintenance, it's easier with the perennials because we have so much bed space it would be hard to plant it in the springtime. What is the difference between an annual and a perennial? Can you explain that please? Well, in our climate a perennial is one that comes up year after year. Uh, annuals will have to be planted every year. An annual might be a petunia, a marigold, things that might be hardy in other climates, but for us they need to be planted every year because they would not survive our winters. How do you decide what to plant in your beds? That's a hard question. Um, we both love plants. We both love unusual plants. We read a lot of catalogs. Um, new plants usually have a choice spot in the garden. Um, sometimes after two or three years, they go out because they haven't actually proven themselves. Um, things for butterflies, bees, we love to plant. Um, Colors, I mean, when you walk around the gardens, you'll see that we do have a preference for different colors. Um, so we try and kind of stick to that color palette. Foliage is a big consideration. Flowers, we consider, but I think plants that have good foliage, we are kind of bumped up a notch on our 
scale. So do you trade plants with other friends that are plant people? I mean, is that a place uh, that you get some of your plant materials from? Or um, do you have any favorite places that you get plants from? I think some of our, our favorite plants are ones that have been given to us or traded with friends. Uh, they have a story behind them and they mean a lot to us. So yes, we do, we do trade a lot with friends or give friends plants and vice versa. How do you care for your plants? I mean, how often do you water and do you fertilize and do you use mulch? Well, this year we've had plentiful rain, so we haven't watered once. Uh, and we try not to get in the habit of having to water plants. We try to use ones that are a little on the side of uh, moisture retentive. But if they're under stress, obviously we, we do need to water. And we, we rarely fertilize plants uh, unless they, um, again, unless they need it. And luckily we have marvelous soils here and uh, they seem to support good life, good plants. Do you add peat moss or any kind of organic matter to your soil? We add um, composted horse manure. We actually use it as a mulch and then as we're maintaining the gardens, we cultivate it in and um, it really makes for beautiful soils. Do you use any edging or anything to help define your beds, your planting beds? We ripped it out. When we bought the house, there was that black plastic edging all around the beds. Oh. Out it went, and now we just have a, an edging spade, which is kind of a half moon uh, type spade, and we use that for make, making a nice crisp edge. So it's just lawn, garden. How has this place changed since you bought it many years ago? As Arla said, the house is, is over a century old, but surprisingly, there wasn't a peony or a daylily on the property when we bought it. And so all the gardens you're going to see today were from us. So it's changed in that regard. Oh my, you've done all of the planting. All by ourselves. How did you decide what you were going to plant when? When we moved into the property, I had had a garden in my previous house. And so from that garden, we brought probably three truckloads of plants. And I think around the house was probably the most important to get started on, just because that's what people saw when they came in. And, and we saw it every day as we were coming and going. So around the gardens around the house were probably the first ones. How often do you divide your perennials? I don't think as often as we might. Um, we generally let them increase until they show signs of decline, and they don't that often. I think the dailies probably uh, are divided, hostas are divided maybe as needed, maybe every three or four years at the, at, the, at the least, really, or at the most, I should say. Yeah, I think because we have such big spaces, we really like to have big clumps of plants and as long as they're healthy we just let them continue. Mm -hmm. When you divide your plants then do you put them into another area of your yard or do you sell them at your nursery or do you use them in your landscaping or do you use them at work at your work? Um, what do you do with your divisions? A lot of them are moved to different parts of the garden. Uh, sometimes we'll give them to friends. Sometimes friends covet something in our garden and we'll chop off a piece and and spread it around that way, but most of them stay right here in the yard. Would you be willing to show us your gardens and your beds and, and kind of point out the unusual plants that you have? Oh, we love sharing our garden with friends. Oh, wonderful. So this is our sunny border. Um, we have a lot of plants in it that um, attract butterflies and bees, as you can see. Um, the colors tend to be kind of muted, softer colors in here. Um, this is a plant that I particularly like. It's Spirobolus. Um, it's a cultivar of our native Spirobolus. It's called Tara, and it doesn't get quite as tall. It's, it's nice for front of the border. Sometimes it's hard to find grasses that do a nice job in the front of the border. Um, this little plant here is Euphorbia mercenides, and it, um, I, I, we didn't think that it was hardy when we first started growing it, and it's proven to be hardy. Um, wonderful texture in the garden, and the color I think is just beautiful. Now I'm going to go back to the drop seed. 
Does this turn the beautiful fall uh, golden color that our native drop seed does too? Yep, it'll turn kind of a real pale golden yellow color. And it, you know, it's a much more upright form than the native spirobolus. Um, I just, I, I think it's just a really great plant for the garden. Um, and of course, coneflowers, there's a million coneflowers. We've, we've kind of narrowed down the ones that we like. This one is Fatal Attraction, and we love the color of it. Now it's faded a little bit, but um, I think earlier in the summer it was quite beautiful. And then we just leave it um, and let those chocolate brown cones add a little bit more interest in the fall. I find I have cone flower in my garden too and I always leave it because it seems like the birds love to eat the seeds over the winter mm -hmm. and so I just let them have it as yes. a food source. So. Yeah, lots of fun. Mm -hmm. And then I like balloon flower, that's what this plant is yes. too, right? Yep, um, we had amazing flowers on it this year. We, it, we were just constantly deadheading it. It's gotten away from us a little bit, but it was a great year for the balloon, balloon flowers. What do, you, what do you mean when you say deadheading? Um, we'll take off. You can see these ugly little flower petals that have gone by. We'll just snip them off like that, and then it'll clean up the entire plant. So picking off the picking old off dead blooms. The old blossoms. Mm -hmm. And what is this fabulous grass that you have here? Yeah, this grass is a Molinia or Moor grass. And this one is called uh, Carl Forrester, not to be confused with Calamagrostis Carl Forrester. So it's a Molinia um, called Carl Forrester. So there are two? Carl Forrester grasses. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and I, Carl Forrester was a um, famous plant breeder, and so there's Campanula named after him and all sorts of different plants that are named after him, and this just happens to be Molinia. And is this hardy? Yes, very hardy. Um, it turns a beautiful golden color in the fall. Um, doesn't stand up with winter snows, mm -hmm. so we'll usually cut it down um, before we get snow. That brings me to a question. How do you care for your plants in the fall? We sort of edit the garden. Um, we don't cut everything down wholesale. We s start to take things down that look kind of crummy or things that we know won't stand up in the winter snow. Um, we love to have things in the garden. Our dining room window faces um, the garden in the winter and so we like to have flower heads sticking up through the snow. Um, we don't mulch the gardens. We count on snow to protect it. I think a couple of years when we haven't had a lot of snow, we've lost more things, but you know, we always think, well, it's a spot for something new. Tell me about this beautiful bluish purple plant up here. I just, that color is just beautiful. <laughs> we were talking about annuals and perennials in the garden, and this is actually one of the annuals that we wouldn't be without in the garden. It's um, Verbena bonariensis. Um, it's a wonderful attractant for butterflies and bees. As you can see, the bumblebees are really working it. Um, it'll bloom all summer long. Um, full sunshine is its favorite spot. It looks like it's fairly easy to grow. Very easy to grow. Um, it, it does seed around. So if you don't like plants that seed around, you probably shouldn't grow it. Um, but it's easy to take out. The roots are just very shallow. And, and we usually plant new plants in the garden because if we would just depend upon the seeded ones, they don't bloom early enough. So we'll rogue out the seedlings and then just put in new plants. I think the flowers are getting more beautiful as we come through here, but please show us or tell us about some of these unusual plants back here. Well, um, this plant right here, the real tall plant with kind of the creamy flowers, is um, a cacalia. The common name is pale Indian plantain. Um, it's native to the kind of eastern part of the United States. Um, we grow it just for its unusual foliage, very bold form in the garden, and it gets tall. You know, when you have such deep beds like we have, you really have to have tall, bold plants. Is that hardy? Yes, very hardy. 
Oh, mm -hmm. so you don't have to plant it every no, year. No, it grows all by itself. Um, and then we've kind of paired it with um, little blue stem, blue heaven that was developed at the University of Minnesota. Um, it, I think it's a beautiful little blue stem. It doesn't flop. It's got kind of that smoky blue color. And then in the fall, it'll turn kind of a, oh, what would I say, a very soft purple color. So nice combination with kind of that purple stem of the cacalia and then the little blue stem. What is this tall plant here? It looks like a Nicotiana, but it's about three times the height of what the normal ones are yeah. we see in the garden. It is Nicotiana. It's a, um, it's a cross between two different species of Nicotiana, and it, it's um, called Bella. And it will get, um, gosh, six, seven feet tall when it's mature. Um, I have a soft spot in my heart for Nicotiana. Um, kind of an old-fashioned flower. They smell wonderful and butterflies love them. So you'll find a lot of, of the taller Nicotiana in the garden. Um, the smaller ones are nice, but I think the taller ones are a little bit more um, open and airy and really fit in with this garden a little bit better. And I see a plant over there that is kind of a beautiful purplish color and the bees have not left it alone since we've been standing here. Um, Angelica gigas or Korean Angelica and it, it's just come into bloom about oh I would say maybe a week and a half ago or so it's a so it's a late blooming plant. Um, beautiful color again beautiful interesting form in the garden and the bees love it. Um, a short-lived perennial um, generally they live about three years and then most often it will die but you always have new seedlings coming along so you can kind of keep them going that way. So it is actually a perennial here? Yes it is yeah. Arla this plant here looks like a type of grama grass. It is it's some um, blue grama grass um, native to our prairies Okay. prefers full sunshine and a well-drained soil. And Steve and I like to grow native plants and also cultivars or selections of native plants. It's kind of fun to see the difference in them. Um, the one right up here has the same sort of a seed head on it, but you can see it's taller and a lighter seed head. That one was a selection from New Mexico and it's um, called Blonde Ambition. So it's Budalua gracilis Blonde Ambition. Not, we found that it's not 100% hardy, um, but we grow it in spite of that just because it's such a beautiful plant. We, I think last year we had a fairly good survival rate, um, but you know every year we lose a few. But some plants you just have to keep trying. <laughs> And it, if you lose one, then it's always just an opportunity to plant another thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for showing us the, the sun plants. Um, I'd like to see the shade plants, too. Oh, great. I think Steve is actually over there, so we can go meet him over in the shade. Sounds great. What is this unusual plant that's right here next to us? That's a Japanese anemone, anemone japonica. It blooms very late, often sometimes uh, the first frost nip it. It has a daisy-like flower, either a white or a pink, a rosy shade. Very attractive, tall, gets up about three, three and a half feet tall or so. Very vigorous. It looks like it's just getting ready to bloom now. I suspect it's gonna be a little bit longer yet. Those buds still look pretty tight. So probably uh, mid to early September. But it also has very nice foliage in addition to having a nice flower, um, it looks like it's a very pretty plant. Well, as we said earlier, we love plants that are attractive even in foliage. They don't always have to bloom, so we, we try to choose plants that are attractive all the time, and that certainly is one. Here is a plant that reminds me of baby's breath. What is that? That's a meadow rue, uh, Thelictrum alba. You're right, it does look like, uh, like a baby's breath, real frothy, filmy. It blooms this time of the year for maybe three or four weeks. It's been blooming for a couple weeks now, and it looks like it's going to continue on even longer. But uh, pure white in the garden is kind of unusual, especially at this time of the year. This heuchera is very, very pretty. And not only are the blooms pretty, but the foliage is gorgeous.
Again, a nice combination of bloom and the foliage. Uh, this one's called Frosted Violet. It has a uh, kind of a silvery cast to the foliage. It probably is getting a little more sun here than it would like. I think the, uh, the color contrast would be a little bit better if it got a little more shade, perhaps in the afternoon. But it's doing quite well. And what is that fern that's back behind it? Well, I used to think that maidenhair fern was my all-time favorite, but this is certainly uh, right up there, too. This is one called Ghost. It's a cross between a lady fern and a Japanese painted fern. So it has the upright character of a lady fern and that frostiness of the Japanese painted fern. Very hardy that can take full sun or light shade. We've got it growing where it gets full western sun and it does just fine. So very versatile. Very versatile, good grower, good increaser, sturdy. And what's that beautiful big plant back behind it? Because again, that's kind of picking up the color tones of the plants right in front of it. Exactly. You've got the purpley shades in all three of these plants here. That's an Actea. It used to be called Simicifuga, also called snake root. Uh, this one's called Actea atropurpurea, with the dark purpley stems and about to bloom. Again, like the Japanese anemone, a, law, a late bloomer. Uh, you can see the buds now just starting to form. So probably uh, later in September, that one's going to flower. And then what are some of these grasses? There's some unusual grasses here in the front. Well, you're familiar with the Japanese forest grass. That's probably uh, the most common of Japanese forest grass, that Hacknocloa macra aureola, but a mouthful. Here's Hacknocloa macra, the all green form, and Hacknocloa macra albo striata, a, uh, a green with a uh, creamy variegation to it. We love it for that kind of that feeling of movement, that feeling of grace. It's uh, really a, a, an outstanding plant for that kind of that wispy, airy, filmy, kind of a whimsical look. In front of your house, I saw a plant that was quite unusual, and it kind of looks like a hosta, but it's not a hosta. It was a, a Brunera called Alexander's Great, a false forget-me-not. This one's quite new, probably the last couple years, known for its large variegated leaf and the, uh, a small uh, forget-me-not like blue flower. Can take uh, uh, quite a bit of shade. It's growing under the shade of a serviceberry tree and doing quite well. Thank you so much for showing us some of these shade plants. How about if we go and join Arla and you can tell us about the plants that are on your patio? Oh, another fun spot. I have a question. I just received an orchid as a gift. How do I make it bloom? Well, one of the most common orchids that people are going to get, whether from the store or as a gift or anything like that, is probably the Phalaenopsis or, or moth orchid. They're air plants. They live up in the trees in the tropics, so they get a lot of their, their nourishment and the moisture actually from the air, whether rain or from moisture from the morning dew or whatever. So I would say water them once a week thoroughly, let them soak, and then um, let it dry out a little bit in between. Lighting, they need good light, but not a lot of full sunlight. Um, I found that growing mine in a north window has worked out really good for me. They bloom usually once a year. Usually in the fall, they start setting up bloom. So if you, know, you bring one home and it's not blooming, say it's summer, it's just it's not its time of year to bloom yet. So given adequate light and, and moisture without overwatering, you should have success, yeah, again, blooming every year. The flowers can last for three to four months, and even with that spray, if you cut it off halfway after the, the flower stem has died, that same stem will rebloom, and you get a whole other spray of flowers so that this one little plant could potentially be in bloom for eight, nine months out of the year. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Steve and Arla, I have a lot of trouble with uh, slugs and uh, also with deer in our yard. Do you have that trouble and what do you do about them? Oh, we have great herds of deer trampling through the garden and slugs, I, would, I wouldn't even know how to count as many. But deer, we've used uh, liquid fence to good results. Uh, we get it on early in the spring, just as the plants are coming up, spray it on everything. And deer seems to be creatures of habit. Uh, once they know that uh, it's uh, not uh, a good garden to come to for food, uh, they'll stay away. But we do keep it up probably every 10 days to two weeks or so, spraying all the foliage that we know that they're going to chomp on, hosses especially. And it's been very effective for us. Slugs are another matter. Um, we've never 
we don't use chemicals in the yard other than this liquid fence I just talked about, but um, they're always a problem. And we found that certain hostas are not prone to slug damage, the ones with the thicker foliage, for instance, and those seem to uh, weather withstand the, the uh, slug depredation. Others, we just, that's how it is. Uh, what are some of the other unusual plants that you have in this section of the yard? Well, behind you, Mary, is an aurelia, uh, one called Sun King. Uh, it has a uh, marvelous lemony colored foliage if it's in full sun. Here, the one we have, it's in a more shade, and it has more of a, of a, a greenish cast to it. It'll get up about oh, four to five feet tall or so. Uh, it's just a marvelous plant for uh, numerous kind of situations. And that is also a perennial? Yes, very hardy. Now, I see next to you, we have such beautiful ferns and begonias. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that fern that's over uh, right by in the midst of these lovely begonias? Um, that fern is not hardy, so it's very tender. It's an Australian tree fern. Um, in nature, they'll get very big. Here in Minnesota, we have to grow them in pots, so they won't get quite that big. Um, but in the winter time, we have to take it into the greenhouse, winter it in the greenhouse. What is that stunning begonia with the huge leaves there? The red, the shiny red leaves, red Fred. <laughs> red Fred. Red Fred. What do you do with all of these plants? These are not hardy for the winter, but what, what do you do with them over winter? Well, when the weather starts cooling down, we'll start taking them over to the greenhouse at Kelly and Kelly and wintering them under cover there. Um, as the greenhouse fills up in the spring with all of Steve's plants, annuals and things, we have to bring them back over to the house and we have lights set up in our basement. And we just keep them down there for about a month and a half or so until the weather evens out and they can go outside on the terrace. You must really have to worry, worry and watch the watering then when you put it in the basement. We do, yes. And I, part of our, um, I think we've learned things through the years with begonias and the, the potting mix that we use is a little bit more free draining than some of them and so they, um, we, we tend to let them dry out between waterings rather than keep them heavily watered. And then how about air circulation? Um, I know in a basement, you know, there's always not the best air movement and begonias can pitch a fit about that. Right, they can be a little bit finicky. Um, we have a fan set up down there and it, um, it kind of moves back and forth so that there's fairly good air movement down there. Well, thank you so much to both of you for being willing to let us come and share your beautiful yard. Oh, you're welcome. We've enjoyed it. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.